All right, good morning, uh, everyone. We're going to... We're going to uh, talk a little bit about exam one uh, to start class, and then we're going to do we're going to do some stuff with chapter three, part six, uniform circular motion, and you're going to want to be able to sketch circles and triangles and stuff. So prepare yourself mentally for that. Get your clickers ready. We'll be doing that in a in a minute. Um, Okay, uh, exam grades are up, as hopefully you have seen. Uh, we're going to do things a little bit differently uh, this semester with exams. Normally, we get a printout uh, for every student, a single page that shows your exam uh, Scantron questions, question by question, what you bubbled in and whether it was correct and what the answer key was, all right? Now, it's uh, something that Darianne and my other TAs uh, usually hand out on a day like this. And then we have a, a, a little bit of lecture, like half of a lecture afterwards. Uh, but we're not gonna do that uh, this semester. We're gonna do things a little differently. Uh, so they got graded really quickly. Um, Darian, I don't know, what time did you turn them in? Almost. Like five. Darian turned them in almost at five, and by about six oh something, I had my email tell me that they were graded and they were up. Um, now there's a few of you that if you look at your grades in web courses, it might uh, have a minus one. You were at the test, but it says minus one for your Scantron, uh, and that will happen. Uh, if you uh, blooped up your PID or the test form or something. Now, we haven't forgotten. No, we, we usually get those sorted out, but we, we don't have the um, exam files or anything yet. Uh, we're going to be getting those this afternoon. But we will get to that. And if you do have a minus one for something, uh, we'll get that sorted out. Um, Tuesday night, I graded the clicking items. Uh, and... Um, I gave partial credit on the two-point questions, number three and number four. We're going to go over number four a little bit um, here before we get down to business with uniform circular motion. Um, if you had, this is something that students have been asking about um, lately, you know, this semester and, and a few times last semester. If you get a zero, on in, in web courses for clicking. What that means is I have your clicks, but you didn't get anything correct. So you don't have any points, all right? If your score says minus one, then it means one of two things. Either I didn't get your clicks, you know, like you didn't hit the send key, uh, or um, you're not registered. Your iClicker is not registered. All right. Now, if you look at your grades page and you see, okay, I got a number, I got a zero or I got a six or somewhere in between there uh, for the clicking part of the score, uh, that's this stuff over here. Uh, let me get my cursor uh, right here. Uh, if you have some dinero in there, then that means you've got, you know, you, we got your clicks, we graded them. And I did give partial credit. Now, it's, it's impossible for you to know that just by looking at the numbers. If you got a six, then that means you got everything right. You didn't have partial credit, you got full credit for everything. But if you have a five, there's a couple different ways to get a five, and partial credit could be part of a, an answer, a score of five. So, but if you want, I can tell you about if, if you got something partial credit or not. If you come to office hours, we can talk it over. Now, our office hours, so far, not a single student has come to my office hours. And I'm stuck, has anybody come to yours? And the same with Ms. Darian, all right? Now we can remedy that if you start coming. Nine, uh, 10.30 to 11.30 on Wednesdays, Physical Sciences Building Room, PS 158. It's the big solarium, the sunroom, right next to the main entrance. Um, now, uh, 
related to the Scantron printouts, um, you're going to have a homework, a very easy homework, homework X this weekend. Uh, did you have a question? A uh, young man with a baseball hat? You just stretch it. Okay. Uh, yeah, homework X is related to your Scantron printouts. Now, if you've never seen them, this is what they look like. All right, this is actually one from my astronomy section, but uh, your guys' printouts will look just like this. Um, and homework X is, is my patented method for you to indicate if you want your Scantron printout, which is in PDF. You know, we don't have the paper this semester. We're going to send them to you uh, confidentially through web courses. Now, uh, the federal uh, privacy regulations for educational institutions like this say that you're not to communicate with students openly or uh, unsecurely about their grade information. So that's why I don't use email. And if you send, and a few students have sent me email, I never respond to them. I'm not allowed to. I don't use email to talk about grades or anything like that. Right? But web courses, messaging, the inbox system is perfectamente. All right? And that is considered secure for the federal educational FERPA. FERPA, Family Educational Resources Privacy Act, or whatever that means, FERPA. All right, so, uh, so we'll be sending this stuff to you through web courses. Now, I'm, I'm going to set this thing up, this homework X, and all you got to do is say yes or no. The correct answer is yes. The, fault, the incorrect answer is no. Now, don't worry about getting a no answer, uh, a, a false, uh, getting a zero on this. It's not going to be part of your semester grade. So I'll factor this out of the, you know, homework totals and stuff. So just like homework zero, that was an attendance grade. This is also a bookkeeping grade. And everybody that says yes, I'll know that they have, they'll have a one. And then Miss Darian will send you your PDF through the web courses messaging system. Uh, and we'll start doing that Wednesday. So you'll have until Tuesday. So I'll nag you about it again on Tuesday next week. And then Tuesday midnight is your deadline to do that one question quiz. So it should work pretty good. And my, we're doing the same thing with my astronomy students. So it seems to be working out okay. Now, along with your printout, I also will provide a little blurb file. And this is my phrase... Uh, to describe a little uh, list that I make up for each test and for each test form on the test uh, so that you could know by looking at your exam printout, you'll be able to see, oh, well, I got number 14 and number 16 wrong, but it doesn't tell me what those two questions were about. Well, the, print, the, exam, the Scantron printout will tell you which questions you got wrong. And the blurb sheet will tell you what question 14 and question 16 were actually about. Now, it's not going to be verbatim, usually. Uh, and the matching won't be on there. But all the multiple choice and true false, there'll be a little description. You know, it might be uh, calculation with simple calculation, Newton's second law. And now, if you got that wrong, you'll know on the final exam... Oh, oh, I better double check my Newton's second law concepts. All right. So the exam printout that you see up there, yours will look something like this one. And then the blurb file for your test form A, B, C, or D, that will make a little mini study guide. All right. So you, you know, if you want it, you got it. All right. I'll make sure that everybody can get that. All right. Now, I want to uh, actually, let's go back to that. Um, are there any questions about uh, this uh, stuff about Scantron printouts and so forth? Okay, let's continue. Let's reinforce. You might want to take notes now. Uh, we're going to reinforce the last clicker item 
Number four, uh, which, you know what, I don't, I don't know if you considered it a brain burner. It was kind of easy if you knew what you were doing, but if you didn't know what you were doing, it would definitely fry your brain. So let's take a look at it and just go over it. Uh, it was this one. Uh, given a velocity graph with this shape, you know, steady four meters per second for the first two seconds, and then a deceleration to a stop by the time you get to four seconds. All right, it's a steady deceleration. And the question was, calculate its position at time t equals 4.00 seconds. So your task was basically to calculate um, the area of these of two distance polygons from this velocity graph. And a lot of you guys got it right. But enough of you uh, blooped it up. I want to make sure to go over it so uh, you can get this down. So um, let's take a look at it. Uh, the first distance polygon, mm, it's, it's a little bit shaky here. Uh, it's this rectangle, right? And then the second distance polygon is this triangle over here. All right, now to get the distance of travel from time t equals zero here to time t equals four seconds here, which was your objective, um, you just got to calculate the area of those two polygons. Now, one of them is a rectangle, length times width. The other one is a um, triangle, one half length times, or one half base times height. All right, so first one, uh, two seconds for the width, four meters per second for the height. All right, so the area is therefore eight meters. All right, but you've also got this triangle here, the slowdown period um, is you're slowing down a little bit um, and uh, you're losing two meters per second for every second of slowdown. Now, I think some of you tried to calculate that, but you didn't really need to. All you had to do was remember one half base times height. All right, so the base of this uh, triangle is uh, two seconds. All right. And the height is four meters per second. And then half of that, there's your calculation, half of that will give you the area of the triangle. Okay? So the first one gives you eight meters per second. The triangle gives you four, another four meters per second, because you're slowing down. Right? So if you if you had continued at uh, steady four meters per second you'd have been at um, 16 meters, but unfortunately you're slowing down and you come to a stop at final position, 12 meters, X subscript F is 12, all right? Is this helping out a little bit? Good. Yeah, I can see you kicking yourself back there, that's good. That's, that's how we learn. So if I give you this question, or something like it on the final. Now, I'm not saying what's on the final, but if I do, you'll be ready. You'll be ready to kick you, kick uh, you know what on the final. And that is what I want everybody to be able to do. All right. So the final answer on this one is 12. Um, and you know what? There weren't a whole lot of uh, bloopers on this one. You either had it or you did. Some people were, you know, way out, and a lot of people had 12s, but um, there weren't a lot of, you know, like 1.2s or anything. Matter of fact, there weren't any decimal points. I made this exam all whole numbers for a reason. Right. Now, the next exam, exam two, yeah, we'll probably start using decimal points, and we might type in some symbols, you know, like those special sentences we made and stuff. Uh, but this is the this is the one. I think this one tripped up more people than anything else. Uh, Katie. Can you explain the of the uh, XF equals 12 meters. You mean right here? 
Yeah, it's the area, it's the sum of these two areas. It's the sum of this area and the sum of the triangle area. Okay, and that's what, you know, the fancy formula, you know, one half AT squared and V times T, you know, those are nice. Um, and if you, you know, if you memorize that formula, you could use it. But really all you have to do is a little bit of, you know, uh, geometry and you can get this one. Another question? All right, let's continue. All right, click time. I'm going short answer, thank you. Not, don't do it yet. Uh, I want you to do is when I start doing it, when I reveal the slide, that way I'll, the time will indicate. Okay. But that's okay for now. Uh, okay, this question, I want you to think about it really carefully. And this is like a survey. So I'm gonna give everybody correct answer on this. Just give me your best. Give me your best shot. What do you think is the correct? Everybody, A, B, C, or D is going to be marked correct. So just which, which one do you think is correct? Read carefully and think. Accelerated, but never speeds up, never slows down. What kind of acceleration is it? What's that? I can't, who's asking me that? Oh, question? Yeah, just type in the, a letter and then hit this. I'm sorry, I should have told you this is a short answer, so you have to hit the send key. All right. And if it's not letting you do that, hit the refresh key and then retype in your answer and hit the send key. When I do, when I do it this way, then everybody can have correct answers. If I do it multiple choice, you don't have to hit the send key, but there can be only one answer that's correct. So this way is a little bit better. Okay. Uh, 15 seconds, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, uh, please display this. Now I want you to look at the uh, set of answers here. Now look at that. There's a fairly good distribution uh, of... A's, B's, C's, and D's, all right? Now, what that means is everybody's got, nobody's got, there, there's no popular conception, you know, that's got a stack of answers. And um, there's a little bit for, you know, a, a, a fairly good amount for each one. So in other words, um, A wasn't ignored by everybody, you know, which sometimes happens, you know, if everybody knows that A is not right, then. Nobody's going to vote for it. But this one, every, every option got some answers. Go ahead back to the regular display, please. All right. Now, the question here, uh, the answer is A, sideways. If you, if you think about it, if the, the, the definition of acceleration is a change in the velocity vector, all right, over time. All right. So if you get a bump in the same direction, you might want to make notes of this, in the same direction as your velocity, and you get a little bit of a force, you're going to speed up. If you get a little bit of a force in the opposite direction, so you're moving this way, and the force is going the exact opposite, you're going to slow down a little bit. Right? Now, if you're not slowing down, and you're not speeding up, that means you can't be in the direction. You can't have any newtons in the direction of the force. You can't have any, excuse me, you can't have any newtons 
in the direction of the velocity, and you can't have any newtons opposite the direction of the velocity, but you could have some sideways and only sideways. And what that would do, a little bit of force perpendicular to the velocity, that'll just change your heading. It'll change your direction. It won't speed you up because it's not, there's no force in the direction of the velocity. It won't slow you down either. It's just simply sideways. So if you're walking down the hall and somebody gives you a slight bump to your shoulder, you know, they, you know, they, they push you a little bit uh, perpendicular to your velocity, you're going to change direction maybe, but you might not slow down very much. Okay. Now, all that is a prelude to this idea of uniform circular motion. Now, I want you to draw um, some circles. Uh, and uh, the first one I want you to draw is this great big one, all right? The center is point C, and I want you to uh, draw two points out on, the, and, and mine are out here on the left side, uh, point K and point U, and they're both the same radial distance from the center. That's what a circle, being a circle means Everything is the same distance away from the center. All right, so we label that R for the radius. And then um, uniform circular motion means that the velocity vector, which is tangent, okay, so here's V2 and here's V1, right? So V1 is the velocity here at point U, and it goes straight up. V2 is tilted a little bit to the right, and the tail of it is right here at point K, all right? Now, here's what I want you to think about carefully. If you've, if you've done this, you know, both of those velocity vectors are perpendicular to the red radius vectors, okay? There's one radius vector from the center out to point K, there's another radius vector from the center out to point U. Now V1 is perpendicular to point, is perpendicular to line segment UC. And its tail, the tail of V1 is on point U. Velocity V2 up here is tilted just a little bit and the tail of it is right here at point K. So it's perpendicular, and hopefully your sketch is good. Now, I've, you know, your sketch might be a little wobbly, but try to make it, you know, as, as nicely as you can. And, and you've seen me sketch stuff out on the diagram or on the overhead. It's sometimes kind of pitiful. So I, I'm not going to criticize you if your sketches aren't so hot, but try to make them as good as you can. Uh, question? Okay, all right, so vector, velocity vector V2 is perpendicular to uh, position vector CK, all right? So you got two right angles up here. Now, uh, what I did was I just copied them down here. Those are my two position vectors vector CK and vector, vector CU, all right, but I took the arrows off, okay? Now, the distance between K and U, that's the change in position. That's, and, but it's not delta X because it's on a kind of a slant. So, but we could call it delta S, change in position, delta S. It's kind of generic, but it's fine. Okay. And hey, you guys, the real path um, for this lower triangle, delta S is a straight line segment. The, the object is actually going on a curve. So it kind of, remember how we had that little crescent uh, when we were talking about uh, trapezoids and stuff? And this is similar. This, the actual path would be a little bit of a circle, a little segment of a circle, but it's pretty darn close to line segment UK, all right? So you can make a note of that. 
actual path is very close to line segment UK, right? Now, up here, I did the same thing with the two velocity vectors. I didn't uh, mark them down though as V1 and V2, but you can see that it's just kind of copied and moved over here to the side so you can see them. Now, the, the line segment between the tips of these two arrows is not delta S, it's delta V, right? So the change in the velocity here is delta V up there. Now, here's a little IQ test question for you. And it's not on, uh, no, it's not on there yet. Don't, don't. This next one's going to be multiple choice, though. Here's a little, and this is, this is a verbal IQ test question, so you, you don't have to click in anything. Um, what's the, look at the sharp acute angle here for the, the blue velocity triangle. And look at the sharp acute angle here for triangles K, C, U. All right, now there's, uh, there's um, acute angles all the way around, all right? But this is the really sharp, sharp acute angle, okay? Now, this acute angle here on the velocity, the sharp one, and this sharp one down here on the position triangle, uh, what's the relationship between those two angles? You think they're the same? Same size anyways? So if this is six degrees here, this will be six degrees up here? It is, that is the, the relationship. So make a note, if the velocity is perpendicular to the radius for both instants of time, then the tilt angle between V1 and V2 up here is gonna be the same as the tilt angle here between K and U, between position vector uh, CK and position vector CU, right? So the sharp, slivery, acute angle is the same, right? So if, it's, if, if one of them is six, then the other is six degrees. You know, if one of them is two degrees, then the other one's two degrees, all right? All right? So now I'm gonna ask you to, we're gonna do an eye clicker question. Hit the refresh key. All right, not yet. All right, here's the question. And I want you to do some sketching here. So sketching these bicycle wheels, it's a little bit like the, this sketch that we just did. Sketching this bicycle wheel, sketching this one a little bit later, and the bicycle wheel has turned six degrees and I've actually done that in the diagram. It's actually to rotate it six degrees. And so then the visual question is, which pair of velocity vectors is the correct, you know, kind of like I did with V1 and V2 on the previous slide. Which, is the, which of these four down here, A, B, C, and D, uh, are the correct uh, set for V1 and V0? It's a slightly different notation. All right, now I'm going to, Sketch in those, uh, those wheels and the velocity. Now, you could sketch in a, a, velocity, a uh, position vector. It's almost like a spoke of the wheel, except the spokes are not directly connected to the, um, to the center of the, of, the, of the wheel. But All right. And this yellow square looks kind of greenish. On the computer display, this uh, yellow square is the point uh, on the wheel that we're tracking. Okay, so this is going to be uniform circular. You know, so if this thing is spinning, you know, so many times per second, and you got a good sprocket and you got a good gear set and everything like that, good bearings, uh, it's going to keep going at that same um, rotational speed for you know a few seconds, anyways. And definitely for six seconds, or for six degrees worth. All right, now I'm going to give you some close-ups here of A, B, C, and D. 
So hopefully you have your two wheels sketched um, and this will help you out a little bit. Here are the close-ups of, and they're different colors. You know, which is the correct pair of V1 and V0? Tail to tail. In other words, we're forming um, a velocity triangle with a good delta V. Which one is which? Dear? Yeah. All right. And definitely, as always, kibitz with an, and consult with your neighbor, coach your neighbor, make sure your neighbor's on the right track. All right. If nobody's sitting next to you, you're on your own. But I encourage you to make friends in this class. And I see some of you guys out there just kind of sitting by yourself, minding your own business. That's normally a good thing, but in class, talking with your neighbors and stuff is sometimes helpful. And if you're smarter than your neighbor, it'll still help you to talk with your neighbor because it'll make you even sharper. And it will make your neighbor sharper. Now, I, I'm not going to say who's, who's smarter. And maybe you shouldn't say either, but whoever is smarter, they're going to get smarter by talking and helping their neighbor. All right, 15 seconds to vote, starting now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. <coughs> and uh, yes, this is the correct one. Most of you got this. All right, now, I've got another clicker question for you. Now, this one's going to be a little trickier. All right? So these are the, this is the right... This is the right diagram or the right configuration of these two arrows, all right? So make sure you have it sketched in, because my next question is about them. The third side, the triangle's base. We haven't sketched it in, but if we did, is it perpendicular to the V0 vector? A, B, C, or D? Read carefully and think. And talk with your neighbor if you like. Okay, uh, 15 seconds, starting now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. What's the vote count? How many people are voting? Have you noticed? Oh, yeah, 120. About. Yeah, I know, but on the other questions. I think it's been about the same for all of them. Okay, okay. 10, 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Go ahead and show this. Uh, now, there's a range of answers. And a lot of you voted for C, but guess what? Go ahead back to the diagram. C is... Uh, C is not correct. Now, uh, I'm going to rotate my... You guys going to modify your sketch um, accordingly. I'm going to rotate my two vectors down here. Now, here's my delta V, that red line segment. All right? Now, that, though, that is not a right angle down here. It's going to be, let's see, this is 6. So if you know your geometry facts, the three angles have to add up to 180. All right, so 6 degrees, uh, was it 6 or 3? 6 degrees, yes, yeah, 6 degrees. All right, so 6 degrees at the top, that means 174 right for the other two so 174 divided by 2 is 87 now that's close to 90 but it isn't 90 it's three degrees away all right so b is correct it's close but it's but it is three degrees away from being perpendicular all right now next question multiple choice in the event that the angle, now we're going to call them VI and VF. VI and VF become really small, like about 0 0.002 degrees. Then the base of the angle, though difficult to sketch, would be closest to. Which of those angles would it be closest to? Think. And just for... This is, this is point 0.2 degrees. And I stretched them out a little bit so you could see that they do eventually separate. That's two tenths of a degree. So 0 0.002 degrees. Whoa. Really slivery. So, so the base angle, it'd be closer to... Now that's 12 degrees up there. All right, so no. but this is and this is 0.2 degrees down here. But we're talking about 0 0.002 degrees. And so what are we closer to? 45, 89, 90 or 180? Mm, mm, mm. Uh-oh. That's the right answer. Good gravy. All right, uh, 20 seconds. Cast your vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Let's show the students this one. Uh, we didn't get a majority correct, but we got a plurality correct. Uh, C is correct. Go back to the regular display, please. Yeah. Yeah, and if, if we make the instant of time between VF and VI smaller and smaller, we're going to get closer and closer to a perfect 90 degrees. Now, theoretically, you're not going to get to 90 degrees, but I mean, if you, you know, that's the, the limit of where you would get to. So make a note of that. If the instant of time is smaller and smaller between VI and VF, your angle gets closer and closer to 90 degrees. Right. 
Next question. How do you interpret the base of the velocity? Actually, I've already mentioned this. How do you interpret that red line segment, the base? Twenty seconds. You already you should know the answer to this because I've already said it about thirty times. Starting now. Fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Zero. Ching. Yeah, you guys are geniuses. 93% uh, of you got it right. Uh, so that's the delta V. Now, the reason we're bringing this up is because um, in uniform circular motion, the angle between the position, the radius vector, and the velocity, if it's uniform circular motion, in other words, it's not speeding up, it's not slowing down, the same rotational rate. The position vector is exactly 90 degrees from the velocity vector. And if you're going counterclockwise or clockwise, you know, in, in, you, know, you know, the velocity vector might be in one direction. And if it's counterclockwise, it'll be in the opposite direction, but it's going to be perpendicular. All right, so the path is a perfect circle. And the speed is constant. Now that's the definition of uniform acceleration. Uh, excuse, excuse me, uniform circular motion. Because it's circular motion, the direction is changing. The speed is not. So this is a sideways bump, a sideways force. And what does sideways mean? Well, if your if your velocity is tangent to the circle and constantly changing. Then there's your tangent line. Okay, so sketching a dot somewhere on your circle. And then draw gracefully a line that just touches that, that dot. Just kind of eyeball it in. Right, just like my dotted line there. And I'm going to go, uh, let's see, this is uh, counterclockwise. Right, so my V is going down and to the left. All right, it's tangent to the circle. And, but it's also perpendicular to the radius of position from the circle center. So that's this vector. All right, so R is from the center out to that square. Okay, and then the tangent line through the square is perpendicular to that radius. All right, so the velocity which is on the tangent line, in this case, you know, down and to the left. Right? That's simply because that's, I chose to go counterclockwise. Clockwise would be up and to the right. You know? So we're just going to settle on this for conversational purposes. Right? So down to the left. And it's tangent, so it's on the tangent line, or it's along the tangent line. So that velocity is going to be perpendicular to R. Right? Now what that means is delta V also at right angles to R. So tail to tail now, your delta V it, at that instant, now this is slithering those two instants of time right on top of each other. The limit, the instantaneous limit is that delta V the base of my isosceles is not, it's not 89.999. It's not 89.9999. It's not 89.9999999999. It's 90. It's perpendicular. And therefore, it's parallel to the radius of position. All right? And that means, so that's delta V. Now, the acceleration is going to be in the same direction, all right? So the acceleration, you know, you've got some delta V. It's perpendicular to the velocity. It's a sideways bump. Um, and it's, theoretically, it's toward the center of the circle. 
So go ahead and draw on a little vector here. I'm burning money. And, and I kind of eased it off a little bit to the side, the green arrow there. All right. I see you guys taking photos of it, but it's going to be on YouTube in about, uh, about an hour or less. So you don't really have to take photos. All you got to do is listen. All right. So the acceleration, it, I'm going to say a, a sentence here that I want you to like permanently engrave into your mind. The acceleration in uniform circular motion is directly toward the center. Now, uniform circular motion. So you're same speed and you're on a circle. And if you are, you're getting some sideways bump and the sideways, in other words, the sideways bump, it's not away from the center. It's toward the center. You know, you do all those velocity triangles and stuff. You get it from 89.9 to 89.99 to 89.99. And then and, you know, all the way to 90. And it's pointed right directly at the center. You know, 89.9 would not be exactly pointing back to center. But 89.9999 repeating, in other words, 90, right back toward the center. All right. Now, there was a question uh, over here. Yeah. Um, one, I don't understand the difference between D and B. D and B? You mean D here? Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so, so delta V is along this radius, all right? And B... Um, <coughs> The velocity, okay, this vector, this black arrow, is perpendicular to this dotted line radius, okay? So that's good. And we know that if, if we squeeze those instances of time together, the delta V, you know, the, the base of the triangle, is going to get closer and closer to 90. So this blue delta V vector is going to be perpendicular to whatever this is, all right? So now if you're, if, if you're perpendicular, so in other words, delta V and the dotted line segment R, they're both perpendicular to this baby. Therefore, they're parallel. All right? Same direction. All right? So it's like the rungs of a ladder. You know, you have your ladder going up, right? And then all the rungs are sideways, you know, at right angles to one of the, so each rung is parallel. I mean, if it's a good ladder, it's not falling apart, All right? Another question. All right, let's keep going. This gives rise to the vocabulary term centripetal acceleration. Now, you've heard the word centrifugal. No. This is centripetal. Okay. This one means toward the center. Centrifugal, it means uh, fugue, F-U-G, the word uh, fugitive. You know, somebody that flees, you know. All right. So... Centrifugal means away, fleeing the center. Right? And that's not what we got here. Now, in, if you're over there in the student union eating French fries and talking about this and that, you'll say, oh man, the centrifugal forces when I was turning in my car. So that's all right. If you're over in the student union eating French fries and drinking a smoothie or whatnot, that's all right. But in here, centrifugal, no. Centripetal, yes. And it means toward the center. Now, centripetal acceleration. And, cent and look, that's the acceleration. So if, if we use F equals MA, that means, you know, the, the net force is in the direction of the acceleration. We also have a centripetal force. All right? So let's take a look at this diagram. The force that produces that acceleration must also be centripetal. All right. Now, I'm going to show you on Tuesday 
why this formula, you've already got the basics of it. Here's the formula for centripetal acceleration in uniform circular motion. Now in this one, V is the speed that it's going. Now it's uniform circular motion. So it's, it's you going around, you know, on the, the merry-go-round at the same speed until either you puke or the guy that runs the merry-go-round shuts it down for the night, all right? So, you know, 33 RPMs or whatever it happens. To, well, that would be a little, ooh, 33 RPMs. That would be pretty fast for a, for a, uh, uh, a merry-go-round. I don't know, that must be... You know, like one or two RPMs for a merry-go-round. Otherwise, all the little kids will start getting motion sickness. But anyways, V is, uh, make a note of this, V is like the speedometer rating. You know, if you were in a car, V would be the number on your speedometer. You know, in meters per second or meters or miles per hour or whatever it happens to be. All right? Now you square that and put it in the numerator, you know, so five meters per second would go to 25 meters squared per second squared. And, but then you got a denominator, and in the denominator is the radius of your circle. So if your, uh, if your speed, go ahead and write this down, it's not in the, in the, in the uh, slides, but I'll give it to you verbally. If your speed is five meters per second, so that's about mm, 11 miles per hour. You could do that in a parking lot. And if your circle is 10 meters radius, you could do a circle, you know, with your car going 11. Now, I'm not telling you to do that, but if you were in a good, a flat parking lot, which I don't think Publix is flat, but, okay, the parking garage. If, the, if you're up on top of the parking garage, uh, and, you know, so they don't have all the pillars and stuff, it's just up there. And, you know, you find a place where you can do circles and nobody else is around and the parking cops are not around and stuff like that. You could do um, a 10-meter circle, 10-meter radius circle, okay, at 5 meters per second. That'd be 11 miles an hour. So 5 meters per second for V, so the denominator is 25. And for a, a you know, fairly good-sized circle for a car, you know, your little Kia or whatever it is that you drive, uh, 10 meters radius, that's 20 meters. So that's about mm, from this side of the room over to maybe this aisle over here, 60 feet, 60-something feet. So you can do it. You can do it turn that size, all right? Uh, so, so that would be 25 meters squared per second squared in the numerator and in the denominator, 10 meters for R. Right, you could do that. All right, now, 25 divided by 10 is 2.5. Right, so that's the size of your... And it's an acceleration, right? You have meters squared per second squared in the numerator, but you have meters in the bottom. So the meters in the bottom cancels out and one of the meters in the numerator cancels out. Now the numerator's got meters squared per second squared, all right? So the cancellation gives you meter per second squared in the top and everything's cut out of the bottom and the numeric part would be 2.5, all right? So if you're in a circle, you're going 11 miles per hour approximately, circle 10 meters, your, your acceleration, your centripetal acceleration, 2.5 meter square, meter per second square. So that's about a fourth of a G. You know, G is about 9.8, so that's a little bit more than a fourth. All right. A fourth of a G would be uh, uh, 2.45. All right. So it's a little bit more than a fourth of a G. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you've ever watched any movies where they have uh, or, or talked to airline pilots, you know, especially guys that uh, fly around in the, in the fighter planes, the attack planes, 
They're t- you know what they do? They talk about you know, uh, pulling G's. And when, uh, the reason they do that is because at those speeds, they're making a lot bigger turns. But, you know, they want to, you know, a fighter jet's got to, you know, move quickly and bob around. And, you know, just like a running bag, it's got to be able to make cuts. Okay, so a fighter jet making a turn, at, you know, they're going to be at speed. They're going to cut the, you know, the steering to the left or to the right. And that's going to produce G's of centrifugal. <laughs> Did you hear me say it? Centripetal acceleration. So a fighter pilot pulls G's, you know, and th- in this car example that I just gave you, you're pulling a quarter of a G. All right. So that's like, for a fighter pilot, eh, that's nothing. That's granny time. All right. But uh, human, uh, humans can take uh, up to about 8 Gs is what I, is that accurate about 8 Gs? Eight to nine. Yeah, maybe a little more if you're, depending. Unless you're in an Iron Man suit. And then Iron Man suit, you know, you can maybe pull a little bit more than that. But, I, you know, but an airplane, usually they test them to about 20 G. So they're, they're a little bit sturdier than the humans inside. Uh, but So here's the centripetal force formula. This is just F equals MA. You know, the A is up above there. And this is the F. You know, so M V squared over R. So centripetal force, centripetal acceleration. So when you're pulling G's, you're pulling G's of centripetal acceleration. Although, you know, you probably hear fighter pilots and stuff bragging, you know, trying to impress girls and stuff like that. Oh, I'm, uh, those centripetal forces were, I was pulling about 20 G's of centripetal force. Well, you're not pulling G's of force, you're pulling G's of acceleration, right? So the first one is your G's, you know? So if you come up at 19.6 meters per second squared in your centripetal acceleration, you're pulling two G's. And oh, you know what else? The space shuttle. I, one of my professors in grad school was a space shuttle astronaut. And I remember asking him one time, because I was teaching a class, and I said, what's the, what's the maximum G's that the space shuttle takes when it's launching? And it's upward G's of acceleration, you know, because they're trying to accelerate upward. You know, so the, when those rocket motors are blazing and, and developing all that enormous force, uh, and he said it's about 3.3, about 3.3 G's. And then after that, it, it calms down to a little bit less than... Uh, three, and then they, you know, eventually they're up there on uh, circular orbit, and you know what gives them, um, you know, when they're in orbit, you know what give, they, they don't have a rocket going; they're just kind of coasting along up there. You know what gives them the centripetal force? The force of gravity, and there's the equation for the force of gravity. And on Tuesday next week, we will talk about Newton's law of gravity. And by the way, I think I've got a, uh, a chapter that I'm just about, re- I'll try to finish my chapter on gravity, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and this is the force law. And notice that it depends on the distance from the center. And this is the center of the earth uh, that your object is. And it's got two masses, the mass of you and the mass of the Earth, and then a big constant G. So we'll talk about this on Tuesday, and I'll give you a free chapter. Uh, your homework is simply to read forward into chapter four and uh, do homework X. All right, and that'll be up uh, probably tonight. You're dismissed. Question.
is means per second squared, right? No. No, this part. It's meters per second squared. No, it's meters squared per second squared. Because it's a speed. Okay. V is a speed, so meters per second. All right. Meters per second for speed. Mm -hmm. And then the square of that uh -huh. is meters squared per second squared. You've got to do both. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're going to. like the one that we had to like type in. Uh oh. Okay. All right. 